Hello, everyone. I'm Becca, dietitian by trade, mom 24-7, wife from the start, and when there's a few extra hours in the day, you might find me hitting the trails or on horseback. And I'm Kara, a therapist to women, a mom to a boy, an entrepreneur, mountain junkie, and a postpartum runner. And this is Fit for a Queen, a podcast that's devoted to the female athlete wanting to balance the teeter-totter of all the things we desire out of life as women. Performance, health, intellect, and taking time for self, even if we only get one minute out of the day. We're so excited to be bringing you the queens in the athletic world who have done just that. Okay, ladies, take a seat at your thrones, grab your crowns, and welcome to Fit for a Queen. All right, Queen. So today we have Julie Duffy Dillon here, and I'm going to share a little bit about her. She is a registered dietitian like myself and an eating disorder and polycystic ovary syndrome specialist. And we'll tell you a little bit more about her um, exciting program that she's created and has um, recently launched. She also has a unique background being a food behavior expert, partnering with people on their food peace journey. She's trained as a mental health counselor and supervises dietitians and other health professionals to use weight inclusive and tuned eating strategies. She owns Central North Carolina's group Nutrition Private Practice and premier source of eating disorder treatment and prevention. Birdhouse Nutrition Therapy and Julie also produces and hosts the weekly podcast Love Food and that's why I've asked her to be on um, Probably one of my biggest inspirations for creating this podcast is I just really love the little bit of wisdom and nuggets that come each podcast and does it in such a fun, interactive way. And I've joked with her that she is my um, passenger on my commutes on Thursday and makes that a little bit smoother. She also is launching a brand new e-course for those of you with polycystic ovary, or we'll call it PICOS called A Step-by-Step Guide to Food Peace with Picos, and you can learn more at Julie Dillon RD and Picos and foodpeace.com, and we'll be sure to have those in the show notes. So welcome, Julie. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I'm so excited to finally actually sit down and chat with you guys. Yeah. Well, we're happy to have you. <laughs> yeah. All right. So one of the first questions that I would love to pick your brain is how and why did you learn to live with this food peace model, especially in this world that is so diet heavy and food is bad and villainized? Well, I'm like, where, where do I begin? I mean, there's so (laughs) many reasons, but, um, you know, it's been quite a journey and, I actually am someone who's never been on a diet, so I feel like this freak of nature, but I have these some privileges, and I've always been in a smaller body genetically. It's just how my family is, and so I don't think I had pressure to go on a diet, and then when I was training to become a dietitian, that's what I was learning that I was supposed to be doing was promoting diets, and it didn't really fit really well with me, and obviously, that's not what I was doing, And um, but yet, I also was pretty timid and I was like, well, this is just what I need to do if I need to get a job. So, uh, and I was broke. So I needed a job. <laughs> and for a few years, that's what I did. I was a diet pusher. And um, I found out after about three years that they really didn't work. And, you know, that's really summing up three years in like, one sentence. But there was a lot of struggle with that. But I, I felt like people were pushing it on people, like the, you know, the people that I was called to help, if they weren't losing weight and coming back you know, as success stories, then, um, they were doing it wrong. But after like a hundred people do it wrong, you kind of, it's like, it's really important to like, but maybe I'm the one that's doing it wrong. And so, um, long story short, it made me start to pursue more behavioral type of interventions. And so I started to experiment with things like motivational interviewing, but I just wasn't really thinking it was enough. And I didn't think I wanted to be a dietitian anymore because I thought dietitians push diets. So I, pursued a master's degree in mental health counseling and I thought I would never be a dietitian again but then I ran into it a meeting and I was like wait oh there's this other group of people out there that are more like me and at the same time because I was in grad school and had access to like all the journals for free um I started looking into the research behind dieting and I'm like oh wait like it doesn't work for most people so basically the research is saying that like it's not that diets whether they work or not, it's just like how long it's going to take for people to regain the weight. It's <laughs> really the thing. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's when I was like, okay, that, that's it. And then when I um, 
I had a job after grad school that still had some diet to it. And actually I worked with people who were going through surgery and liquid diets and really crappy things like that. And, um, I was only there for about six months before I had to quit. Cause I was they, they were like, you have to do this if you want to keep this job. And I couldn't do that part of it anymore. And, and that's the last time I, I, um, pushed any kind of diet was right around that time. And for a long time, I, I said I was a non-diet dietitian. And one of my friends, her name is Maria Paredes. She's a therapist in Greensboro and also weight inclusive. And she was like, you know, you're kind of uh, defining yourself in this negative. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's a good point. And so that's when I was like, oh, well, maybe it's food piece because that's like more positive, right? So right. that's kind of how I started using that word instead. I'm like, let's make it a positive instead of this negative thing. Um, so I consider myself as a fat positive dietitian and a food piece dietitian. So okay. that's my journey. <laughs> So tell me, because this is geared towards female athletes, but we want it to be inclusive to everybody. Athletes tend to really hone in on food, diet culture. You have to eat this food for performance. How do you see them be able to live out and have peace with all foods, but yet still feel like they can maximize their performance? So something many don't know about me is that I used to be an athlete and um, I was a cross country runner and swimmer. And although I, my track coach would jokingly say you could tie me with a calendar because I, was, I wasn't very fast, but I was a long distance runner, whatever. Um, I was never going to be good at the 800. So I was a runner for a long time. And that's something that I noticed when I was in really deep with sports was that the better I fed myself, what, the better I was at it. And I think what's really important to keep in mind is what does actually the word better mean? <laughs> and and it's, um, I think it's really important for athletes and any human walking the earth to remember that they are the expert of the body. And when we connect with what helps us, um, it may not be what helps everybody else. Um, and it could vary based on like where you are in training or where you are in life. And so yeah, I feel like, especially as athletes in, in the sports that I was in, you know, the lower weight was always preferred. And I feel like that's such a um, harmful thing because maybe for some people that helps or maybe for some people certain plans help, but does it help you? And I think for so many athletes, they just blankly follow a rigid regimen without really asking themselves, is that actually feel better? Do I have more energy? Am I improving my time? Instead of like, I just need to train harder. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, why not um, actually, you know, looking into yourself. And I think as an athlete, you have to be really in tune with your body and able to keep pushing it. And so it's, I feel like it could be quite a great marriage of, of um, remembering that you are the expert. And, and that's a, a key intuitive eating kind of principle is that you do know it's best. And so keeping that in mind, I feel like is a really great way for an athlete who's really using food to help to make it sure it's helping and not harming them. Um, I hope that makes sense. But that's, that's, that's like what I've always counseled my athletes to do is like, keep in mind that, you know, it's your body and, and you may find different things work for you that don't work for other people. And that's okay. And you may have to change it, especially as we get older. Sure. Know? I think that's such a good um, point because so many of the athletes are comparing themselves to others on the team or the new kind of fad diet for athletes uh -huh. that's popular right now versus what's best for their individual performance and sport and where they're at. So I like that. And I like how you bring up what's better. I think a lot of times they're not even stopping and evaluating if their change in food is actually improving their performance. They're just caught up in like, well, I'm doing something well, it doesn't do any good if you're slowing down or you're more sick. Mm -hmm. and it makes, right. it yeah. makes me think of a story. I remember running this race one time and there was this gentleman in front of me and he was pulling out Snicker bars and eating them um, during the race. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange to be eating a candy bar. And then I thought, well, but Becca, you're behind him. So. <laughs> that's right. No judgment. You can't really judge him when he's beating you. So it just well, kind of I mean, humbled I, me. I feel like most of us know Nancy Clark, right? Oh, and yeah. She's like the sports dietitian, right? So, um, and I can't remember if she said this in a training or if I read her in an interview. And Nancy, I'm sorry if I'm like quoting you wrong. But um, I can remember her saying something about someone complaining about being hungry in the corral before a marathon or like hungry by mile three of a marathon. Um, and she's like, well, like going through some different things she, that this person could do. And, 
it ended up that the person really liked Dr. Pepper or some kind of soda or something. And she's like, well, just drink a 20 ounce soda while you're waiting in the corral and that'll help you from being hungry. And I was like, what? She said soda? Actually drink soda? And um, I'm like, but you know, sometimes you have to think outside of the box and there may be foods that are super quote unquote bad for athletes, which I mean, I'm not going to I, I, nobody can see my little air quotes besides you two, <laughs> but sometimes, um, there, I think it's important to make sure you remember that you're an individual and these like blanket statements that people put out there are just general and you may be missing out on this really cool tool that food can be giving you to be performing better and like helping your relationship with food in the long run, which I feel like helps you be a healthier human in the long run too. Great. Well, one thing, we're seeing a trend in polycystic ovary syndrome in the world of sports and how it was stereotyped. Unfortunately, that's always around people that are overweight and sedentary. Um, And we plan to have some more experts on here that talk about it in the athletic world. But I really want you to tell everybody about your new program that's out there and how they can find it. Well, sure. And, you know, PCOS, I think, is, um, or that polycystic ovarian syndrome is super common in athletes. And I don't think Mm -hmm. a lot of people realize it. Mm -hmm. Um, But so many people that I work with, a lot of times I work with them after their athlete time is over for whatever reason, which I feel is really sad. But I think their relationship with food um, and their body becomes so complicated because they see their weight going up for many of them. And so that then they try to change it and then that gives them zero energy. So then they start to not perform as well in their sports and they quit. And when I talk to so many people with PCOS, I'm like, were you ever a really good athlete? And they're like, yeah, I was a college soccer player. I was a basketball player. I was really good in high school. And I'm like, so what happened? And then they tell me that whole spiel, you know, and the thing to keep in mind about PCOS that I want everyone to remember whether they use a program that I have or not is that um, weight change with it doesn't cause it. And um, weight, weight change is just a symptom of it. And it stinks because I feel like we live in this really fat phobic world that villa, uh, villainizes or vilifies. I don't know if which word is correct, <laughs> but um, <laughs> makes fat really bad. And it just focuses on that instead of like, oh, this is a symptom of something else. And so if you notice that, Don't necessarily just tweak your food or um, exercise more. It may actually be that something's going on that your body wants you to attend to. And with PCOS, I feel like that's just part of the language. Like there's just a different language going on that people without this condition don't have. And um, it's important to attend to. And that's what my training is all about is is helping people who experience PCOS to reconnect with that expert role of their body. And Unfortunately, dieting is the number one way that people are told to control their PCOS. It's Absolutely. like the primary treatment. Any journal article you read by some researcher, that's the first thing they say we should do, which is awful because there's no um, there's no diet out there that shows long term success for anyone. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> there's nothing out there that we know is evidence based. And I mean, this of course includes athletes, right? I mean, there's mm-hmm, nothing right. out there that actually is going to cause any kind of long-term help. And with, with PCOS, the thing that's crappy about it is that the longer someone starts that's dieting along with, you know, doing their sport and, you know, combining those two together, a lot of times I think we're used to like weight loss happening for people without PCOS and it causes that low energy availability and, 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 um, you know, people will lose their period and stuff like that. But what happens with people with PCOS instead is their weight goes up. And that's because of this chronic inflammation associated with it and the high insulin levels. And so what my program does is it helps people to target their insulin levels to bring those down. So then they have energy again. And that's when people are like, oh, you know, I'm kind of craving some movement. What should I do? (laughs) Well, what do you want to do? And that's how I know that insulin is coming down is that people's bodies will like, they're like, I want to move again. And it's so cool because I get to see people who are college athletes and were excelling. Um, and now they're in their thirties or forties going back to their sport and they're like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm still good at it. You know, and um, it may feel different and it's a different kind of level or whatever, but they're like feeling joy from it again too. So that's really exciting. Um, and one way you can connect to these programs, um, like you said earlier, that PCOS and foodpeace.com, that website has um, a free video training if you want to just kind of check it out and get a feel for it. But then there's also a course associated that I'm 
helping people who are just wanting a non-diet way to treat their PCOS. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. to wrap up the whole pushing diets, I remember one time hearing Dr. Tyson, he's like, if you were to go into a physician and he handed you a script for a medication and told you that you know there's about a 99.9% chance that this prescription would be ineffective, would you go ahead and take it? And everybody's like, no. <laughs> well, then why are you taking a diet then? Uh-huh. <laughs> I love well, it. and I, it's really, really horrible, though, because with anyone who's listening who has PCOS, they, I know they're getting this because they're, they're like, Absolutely. I feel awful or I have these cravings or my mood is horrible or I want to get pregnant. I want to have a baby. Right. And the way that they're told that they have to treat it is, well, you just need to lose weight. And mm-hmm. we don't have any way to do it. And for people with PCOS, it just makes them worse. It doesn't improve anything. It may improve it for like two weeks and then it goes away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and so, yeah, that I agree with Dr. Tyson completely. You know, I'm like, why would you, you wouldn't, we wouldn't like fill any script that had like a 99% chance of failing. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, Julie, we like to end each interview with um, asking you how to how you live the fit philosophy. How do we um, increase performance, focus on our health, intellect, and time for self? So how do you live the fit philosophy yourself, Julie? So I was thinking about this, and I'm like, <laughs> how do I do it? And um, I had to almost... Um, let myself still call myself an athlete at times, you know, cause I'm like, I'm not out running all these five K's or marathons anymore, but I still am active. And what comes to mind for me to live out that type of philosophy is one word and it's boundaries, you know, cause my, my life has no balance. I'm a primary caregiver and, um, I have two children and I have a, my own business and stuff like that. <laughs> and, and, uh, the only way I'm able to, stay connected to my body and perform well and focus is I need to have really good boundaries, Mm -hmm. which means for me, it's like, I have to say no. I'm like, no, I can't do that. No, I can't do that. Um, and I feel like I'm 42. So I'm like, finally, I feel okay doing that. And what I'm noticing is that I'm, I have energy now to focus and my, um, I get more out of moving my body. Like I feel like it is invigorating and empowering, uh, which I feel like that's what movement or exercise isn't, I don't know, like whoever made it up, that's what it's intended for. It's, it's supposed to like help us feel good and um, powerful. And so by setting boundaries in my life for basically self-care and taking care of myself, it's allowed me to live out that type of philosophy. Great. Well, we'll be sure to put all your information on the show notes. And thank you so much for taking the time. And again, thank you for being the inspiration for why I beg Kara to do this podcast with me. (laughs) I'm so glad you're doing it. It's such an important voice. I'm glad you're bringing this conversation to athletes because they definitely need it too, just like Mm -hmm. the rest of us. Yes, they do. Well, have a great rest of your day. Hopefully you can get a break from the computer. That's right. (laughs) Bye, Julie. Bye. Thank you to our sponsor today, Sentimano Counseling. Sentimano Counseling is the premier perinatal mental health practice in Kansas City, treating mood disorders during pregnancy and postpartum, perinatal loss, infertility, eating, and exercise disorders. Go to sentimano.com for further information about the practice and services. For additional information on today's topic and guests, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at fit for a Queen. And Hashtag fit for a queen. And don't forget to rate us on iTunes. We can't wait for you to join us next time on Fit for a Queen. Bye, Queen.